All right, everybody. So uh, I'm Dick Vandenberg. I've lived in town here a long time, about 42 years or so. And I'm hoping um, to once a month talk a little bit about the progress of American history. So today we're going to look at, uh, or tonight we're just going to look at the 13 colonies and some of the differences and similarities. So a couple things to note about the original 13. Uh, one of them is that we're a seaboard set up. So the orientation of all the colonies at first was to the Atlantic, particularly to Britain. But the other part of the map is you've got the border on the west, which is basically the Appalachian Mountains. And this is going to be a big deal because after independence, well, even before independence, the Brits tried to control the settlement west of the Appalachians. They had a treaty with the Indians, uh, the French, and so on and so forth. And after independence, they wanted to control the movement of people across the Appalachians, but those people didn't want to be controlled. And this idea that we're independent, we're going to do what we want to do as Americans, that really becomes a big deal across the Appalachian Mountains. So those two things are really important to begin with, that we're an Atlantic-oriented country and we have the spine of the Appalachians to the west and it's going to be a big deal later. So here's a chart of the, um, the 13 colonies, and you'll note that the first one, Virginia, 1607. The last one, Georgia, 1733. So that's 126 years. So I think that surprises people. I think we so often think that the first 13 colonies, they all just sort of came, not at once, but pretty close to each other. But there was really quite a spread. A couple other things to note. One is that some of the states had parts to them, like Massachusetts had a Plymouth colony and Maine was actually separate. Connecticut had two. New York was started by the Dutch but became English. So some of the colonies, even within their own history, have some uh, variations. And then you'll also note that um, a lot of them have charters, basically a document from the king that gave them the right to do what they wanted in their own colony. Not all of them did, like the pilgrims in Plymouth didn't have a charter, and the people in New Haven, Connecticut, who split off from Massachusetts didn't have a charter, and then the New Jersey guys, they didn't have a charter either, partly because they were just real good buds with the, the royal people in England. And uh, by the time we get to the Revolution, 1775, you'll notice that a lot of these charters had been taken away by the, the King of, uh, of Britain. But the striking thing, I think, for a lot of people is you have such a big time period between 1607 and the last one of Georgia in 1773, uh, 1733. And by the way, everybody, what two New England states are not in the original? Vermont. Vermont and Maine, right? Um, Vermont was actually disputed land between uh, New Hampshire and New York. And they became a state right after uh, independence. Maine was actually part of Massachusetts mm -hmm. and broke away in 1820, which uh, is another story for another time. All right, so we're going to open up with Virginia. That's the oldest. And you'll note that it's all one state. There's no West Virginia. West Virginia comes out during the Civil War. And one of the reasons is because of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, this part of Virginia doesn't lend itself to plantation slavery. So when the Civil War came and this part of Virginia left the Union, the people in the western part of the state said, well, we don't have slaves. And they actually stayed with the Union and it became a state in 1863. But this is the first, uh, the first colony, Virginia. And I think it's uh, fascinating that it was actually set up by merchants. So one of the themes we often talk about as Americans is that we were started for religious freedom, but the first colony was all about money. It was all about money. Uh, the merchants of Virginia got permission from the king to come to Virginia. They were not thinking about staying for a long time. 
They thought they'd come in, live for a couple of years, make their money, and get out. So religious freedom, that becomes a big deal, but that's later. The, the original uh, people in Virginia were about to make money, and they got a charter, and I mentioned this early, but the charter idea is really important because it basically said that the white Europeans who settled in the 13 colonies had the same rights as Englishmen. Okay, that's huge. The reason it's huge is when we get to the revolution, um, this idea of no taxation without representation that the colonists talked about was basically an English idea. So these ideas of being Brits is one of the reasons we end up revolting because we felt our rights as Brits were not being honored. But um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but for a long time uh, it was sort of fashionable not to call the revolution the revolution, but to call it the War of Independence. You would hear this from people that, well, it wasn't really a revolution because we were just being British. It was uh, not a revolution in terms of big changes, but in fact it was a revolution, uh, particularly when it came to uh, free market, economy, entrepreneurship, equality of all people. You're not doffing your hat to people in public anymore. But this idea that we're really Brits is uh, a big part of it, and it starts in Virginia with the Charter. So here's Jamestown, right down here, the first uh, settlement. And I put the map up here because this is going to become one of the great historic areas of our country. Richmond, during the Civil War, was the focus of a lot of fighting. So if you, if you travel around this part of Virginia, you see a lot of Civil War battlefields. Yorktown, where the Brits uh, surrendered to Washington, is uh, right in there, Williamsburg, some of you have been. So this is where the first um, guys settled when they came to Jamestown. So here's an artist view of Jamestown, and it's sort of an idyllic view that they, they pulled in and they set up. But as you know, if you've studied this, it was really hard. A lot of people died. A lot of people starved. They didn't know about living in this kind of climate. And we have a lot of great stories, like the story of Pocahontas. Now, this is kind of not what the Disney version is. Um, the latest scholarship on this is that when Pocahontas rescued John Smith, they weren't really going to kill him. It was more of a symbolic ritual about who's really in charge. And So when she did what she did, it was still important, but it wasn't like his, his life was really in danger. Um, but that's one of these stories from early Virginia that we sort of absorbed in our culture. By the way, where does Virginia get its name? Anybody know? Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth's name was the Virgin Queen, right? Because she never got married. So Virginia from the Virgin Queen. What really saved everybody's uh, bacon in uh, Virginia was tobacco. So the merchants of Virginia, they thought they were going to find gold and all that kind of stuff, but there wasn't any. And tobacco, of course, was something they learned from the native people. So this is a, one of many examples where the Europeans came to the New World and learned from the people who were already living here what to grow, what to eat. And it was tobacco that really uh, got Virginia going uh, financially. Even though James, uh, Jamestown is named after James II, he didn't like tobacco. He thought it was a uh, a filthy habit. This is in Williamsburg. Some of you have been. Uh, this was all redone in the 1930s to sort of get that look and feel of colonial uh, Virginia. But this is one of the first examples of uh, legislative assembly. So this is another thing we get from Virginia is the idea of the House of Burgesses. But here's another legacy of those early years, and that is it was pretty apparent right from the start that the native peoples did not have immunity to smallpox, pneumonia, flu. And as, as people look at the decimation of the Indian tribes, the, the biggest percentage seems to be from disease. And this started almost right away. In those early days of Virginia, they noticed that um, 
a lot of Native people were dying from stuff that you and I just have in our bodies because we come from a, a different culture. They didn't have COVID back then, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first slaves came to the country in 1619. Um, we're pretty clear about that. Um, and one of the developments, of course, in the 13 colonies will be some states have the climate for plantation slavery and some people don't. But in, in the uh, Gettysburg Address, I mean, in the uh, first inaugural, Lincoln talks about, you know, how many years people had been in bondage in, um, in the New World. And he could do that because records were pretty clear already, you know, in the 1860s that the first slaves came in 1619. Okay, the second colony is New Hampshire, and uh, you'll note it's a lot different shape than it was today. And where does New Hampshire get its name? Any volunteers? Hampshire. Hampshire, Hampshire in England. England. Yes, Hampshire. correct. Okay. I think what's funny about New Hampshire is, is part of it, uh, this Captain John Mason got a grant from the Crown based on a map that none of these guys had ever seen. It's called the Mason's Patent, and uh, it's basically... So here's Kittery, Maine, here's New Hampshire. That Mason's Patent basically just sort of follows the river into New Hampshire and then back again. It's real loosey-goosey. And uh, the other thing about New Hampshire, this guy, uh, David Thompson was actually the first Brit to settle near the Piscataqua River where the big bridge is over to Maine. And some of you have been to Strawberry Bank. That's a really neat part of, of Portsmouth. But the, the fellow at Mason's Patent, he never even came here. Mm -hmm. And this happened with a lot of those colonies is that the maps were made in England and they were given to somebody and maybe that person came here, maybe that person didn't. Like in... Um, the Carolinas, the eight proprietors, I'm going to talk about that later, but only, only one of them ever came to the New World. The other seven stayed back in, in Britain. So that's part of the New Hampshire story is the mapping was really weird, and out of it's going to come Vermont. Vermont is going to be claimed by both New Hampshire people and New York people. And the reason Vermont could even come into existence was, was because of all the vagueness of the map in that, that early part of New Hampshire. Okay, we all know about Massachusetts, so we're the third one, date-wise, uh, the Pilgrims and the Puritans and the Mayflower. Uh, anybody know where our state gets its name? Massachusetts? It's Indian. Indian name, and uh, the original Indian tribe lived in uh, Quincy, <clears throat> south of Boston, and there's actually a little park in Quincy where there's a little marker but on this spot the Massachusetts Indians live. This is what's confusing for a lot of people when they study this. You've got the Pilgrims and the Puritans and how do you keep them straight and what's the difference? So the Pilgrims were Plymouth. The Puritans were Boston. Pilgrims came first, 1620. Boston, 10 years later, 1630. Um, they tended to be separatists, so they did, didn't want to be in the Church of England, they wanted to be separate. Whereas the Puritans wanted to stay within the Church of England and purify it, hence the name Puritans. One of the fascinating things about this story, in my opinion anyway, is once the pilgrims come to Plymouth, more and more white Englishmen keep coming to the New World. And one guy goes up to what becomes Boston and sort of squats there. He, he farms land basically where Beacon Hill is. Uh, he just sort of did that on his own. And in 1630, when the Puritans showed up in Boston, there was this guy living there already, basically where Beacon Hill is. And they said, well, what are you doing here? Well, I'm living here. Well, where's your deed? Well, I don't have one because it was all wilderness. Eventually this guy left and moved down to Pawtucket, and his name was William Blackstone. Uh -uh. That's where the Blackstone River gets its name. And in the Boston Common today, 
there's a, what they call the Founders Monument, 1630, and you see these uh, Puritans coming up in their boats and the Indians are there, but there's this white guy who's shaking hands with John Winthrop. Well, that's, that's uh, William Blackstone, the Blackstone River, our river. <laughs> Gets a name from a guy who sort of snuck up uh, into the Boston area after the the, uh, the Puritan. And that's not even anywhere near Boston. I thought his right. name would be Beacon because you kept saying, be, you know, Beacon yeah. Hill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think the other thing too is, you know, the, the Pilgrims came first, but they were swallowed up eventually by the Puritans um, for for lots of reasons. And I think one of the neat things about our county map today in Massachusetts is this line represents the difference between the Plymouth Colony and the Puritan Colony. This was the border in 1630. And when they drew the counties, they preserved that line. So this was all pilgrims and this was all Puritans and eventually the, the Puritans took over. Can anybody name all the counties of Massachusetts? <laughs> Uh, I used to, but I can't anymore. And then this is what I was talking about earlier. In 1820, when Missouri entered the country as a slave state, they needed to balance it in the Senate, so they carved a free state out of Maine. So Maine had been part of Massachusetts until 1820. And the reason Maine got pulled out is because of the tension between North and South over slavery. So one of the examples of that today is when our Massachusetts kids don't have school because of Patriot's Day, so do the Maine kids. Because they were part of Mass during Lexington and Concord. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, if you go up to the State House in Boston, which was built in 1798 when Maine was still part of Mass, if you look at the dome of the State House, the top thing there is a pine cone, which stands for the lumber industry up in Maine because we were all the same state back then. So inside the state house is the cod, on the roof is the pine cone, but that's me. So This is misunderstood by a lot of people. So when the pilgrims were coming into to Plymouth and getting ready to step on Plymouth Rock, right, which they probably didn't do, they did sign a compact, and a lot of people think this is sort of like an early constitution. It isn't. But it was an agreement for people to work together. So that's important, but it's not like a mini constitution. It, it wasn't that kind of a detail, but it was still an important development in our, our government. And Plymouth Plantation, some of you've been. Um, this is actually not on the site of the old Plymouth. It's about two miles south. This is Rockefeller money that this like uh, Sturbridge Village, that kind of thing. That doesn't mean it's not authentic, but it's not in the same place that the original was. My wife and I were here a couple of years ago, and I was trying like crazy to get somebody to get out of character. Because you know when they're here, they never, that's all the these and the thous, right? Yeah. And uh, they just wouldn't do it. At one point I said to one of the people, hey, just between us, what about this thing? And, and this person wouldn't wouldn't play ball. <laughs> but it's it's cool to visit, right? Everybody been Plymouth Plantation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Many times. Yeah. Have you guys been? We have not. Justin. <laughs> put it on the to-do. We'll get there. Okay. I was like every year in school that was our field trip. For yeah. So many years. Yeah. Alright, so now we're going down to Maryland. And uh, Maryland was founded by Roman Catholics. And Lord Baltimore was the guy. And where does Maryland get its name? This is when people often get wrong. They think it's Mary, the mother of Jesus, but it's actually Mary, the wife of the King of England. So, Maryland. And um, founded by Catholics, George Calvert is known as Lord Baltimore. Well, one of the things that they didn't anticipate was how many Protestants would move into Maryland. So it was originally set up to be kind of a safe haven for Catholics, because Catholics had been persecuted in England. But because so many Protestants ended up moving to Maryland, they had to come up to, with some kind of agreement to live together. And this is the result, the Toleration Act of 1649. 
So this is one of these things that we love to study as we study American history because it's about being tolerant, but it wasn't totally tolerant. For instance, no. if you denied the divinity of Christ, you could still get killed. And it basically was a way for the Catholics to absorb more and more Protestants into Maryland and still coexist. But it wasn't this freedom of religion like we have in the First Amendment. It moved us in that direction, but it wasn't like we have in the First Amendment. Um, and you'll notice there's a little, little anti-Semitism in here too, because no Jew is going to say Jesus was divine, right? By the way, where's the oldest synagogue in the United States? Yeah, Rhode Island. Yeah. Roger Williams. I think another really interesting legacy of Maryland is when they surveyed the northern border, the Mason and Dixon line, two surveyors. This becomes the unofficial border between North and South during the Civil War. And when, I'm, when we get to the Civil War, uh, I'll mention this, but when Washington, D.C., you know, was here, when the Civil War started, Lincoln was really nervous because it seemed like he was surrounded by slave states. Even though Maryland stayed in the Union, it was, it was pro-slavery. But So Mason-Dixon line was kind of that unofficial border between North and South, which is the border of Maryland. Yeah. And I, this is not my photo, but I think some, you can still find original Mason-Dixon line boundaries down there. Uh -huh. uh, has anybody seen one in real life? I, it's on my to-do list. After the Snooks go to Plymouth. <laughs> I'll go down here. Okay, number five is Connecticut. This is an interesting one for us because it was basically guys from Massachusetts who went down to Connecticut. And um, they actually had a bunch of different colonies in Connecticut because New Haven was one all by itself. They settled in Hartford and then some more people went down here. And this is crucial. So they did do what are called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. It was the first written constitution in North America. Talked about self-government. Again, voting is limited to adult men, probably, who own property. But one of the things we like to look at on all the early colonies is what do we find in them that helps set the stage for later, either for good or ill. And this is one of the examples of them moving toward uh, a constitution. Now, I'll just ask this of the group. Um, the Brits have an informal constitution. They don't have one written like we do. Theirs tends to be a collection of uh, customs and that kind of stuff. Uh, what would be the advantage of that kind of constitution, where it's not written? A lot of gray areas. OK, elaborate. What do you mean? It could be someone could interpret a custom one way, and someone else could say, well, we interpret it this way, and they make a happy medium. They come to a consensus, whereas a written one, it is as it's written. Yeah, so one thing about the informal constitution that Britain had is it tends to honor more local. What you want to do in Yorkshire might be different than what you want to do in Wales or something. The other pushback against written constitutions is that they were seen as limiting. I mean, how can you think of everything? So if you try to write everything down, what if you skip something? So what we do in our federal constitution is in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, we have general clauses like powers not given to the states, or to the federal government are given to the states and to the people. And then we have the other amendment which said, you know, you have other rights than these that are listed. So when these guys were writing constitutions, that was considered pretty radical. Uh, because the idea that, well, you can't get it all correct if you write it. So leave some gray areas, as you mm -hmm. said. Yeah. And even today, Britain doesn't have a written constitution like we do. Mm. 
Okay, Rhode Island. Um, what happened within the year about the official name of Rhode Island? Anybody catch that? The official name was... Plantation. They got rid of that. Yeah, yeah it was called the Providence of Rhode Island and something, something, Plantation. Yeah. And at the last election, they had voted to get rid of that word, Plantation. Um, all, the, all the states had slaves at one point. I mean, we did too in Massachusetts, Rhode Island too. So Rhode Island is our neighbor. Um, some of you have been there a lot. You know the various counties. Now, by the way, we'll, uh, so let's see, Virginia is the Virgin Queen, Maryland is Mary, um, Massachusetts is the Indian tribe, Connecticut is from the river. Where's Rhode Island get its name? People don't agree on this one. Historians still disagree. So one uh, theory is Adrian Block, Dutch guy who gave Block Island its name. Supposedly, as he was sailing along the coast of Rhode Island, it reminded him of the outline of the Isle of Rhodes in the Mediterranean. But the, the Dutch who settled this area, the word for red is rude, and supposedly they were sailing along Rhode Island during the autumn. <laughs> they saw the red leaves. So, you, you decide, everybody. You pick, okay. Not quite sure. So here's Roger Williams. Some of you know his story. He got kicked out of Massachusetts because he didn't want to live under the strict rules of the Puritans. What's true about this painting is he did try to live with the native peoples and honor them and so on. But what's false about it is nobody knows what he looks like to this day. There's no figure of, uh, of Roger Williams. People think that's him on top of the dome in Providence, but it isn't. Uh, somebody else. So when Roger Williams first set up shop in um, Rhode Island, he, they actually landed here. So if you ever take 146, 95, 195 to the Cape, and you get the Gano Street exit, and you go like you're going up here, there's a little, little park, it might be this one, where there's a marker on this spot Roger Williams um, landed, but they wanted the afternoon sun. So they ended up setting up right here. And that's where that little historical park is in downtown Providence. Um, and the big Baptist church that he's associated with is, is down there too. But this is what I think is the absolute coolest thing in all of the state of Rhode Island. This is the charter, the actual charter of Charles II. I kid you not. It's big. It's behind bulletproof glass in a vault that it closes up at night and sinks in the floor like in the Smithsonian or something. So Roger Williams, he was a savvy guy, and he, he started, the, um, he started the, the colony, but he wanted that paper charter from the king because that gave Rhode Island the ability to do what it wanted to do. And he went back and forth, and it's three months like, each direction to cross the ocean. But he went back and forth a bunch of times to London to get that physical charter from Charles II, which he did. And you can see it today in the State House during the day. You can walk right up to it. It's in Latin. Huh. It's got Charles' signature on it. It's from 1660 or something. It's so cool. So that's on the to-do list, you guys, after Plymouth. <laughs> Make a list. <laughs> Now, Delaware's uh, got an interesting name. Everybody thinks it's named after the Delaware Indians or the Delaware River, but it's actually named after a Mr. De La Ware, who was a governor of Virginia. Go figure. And what makes Delaware kind of a fascinating one is it was first going to be a place for Swedes. But the Dutch, who were here, didn't want to have a Swedish colony to their south. And the Dutch actually attacked the Swedes near where Wilmington is, I think, and defeated them. So that Swedish influence in Delaware sort of evaporated. And Delaware just became, you know, a little state tucked down in there. But it was originally going to be a, a Swedish thing. But the legacy is the log cabin. The famous log cabin that Abe Lincoln grew up in is actually modeled on something they did in the forests of Sweden. And uh, they were introduced to the United States uh, in Delaware. 
So go figure. A Swedish cabin is the legacy of, of Delaware. All right, so Carolina is the next one. Um, it was first one big colony. Carolina comes from the Latin word for Charles, Carolus. So Charles II is the king of England, and he has some buds that he's going to give some land to. So he does, and there's Charles II. So his dad, Charles I, got beheaded during the English Civil War. Oliver Cromwell took over. Charles II split, lived in France for a while and other places. He finally came back, and it was time to keep resettling North America. So he really wanted um, people to move out there. So Car the Carolinas are related to him. So he had eight friends who he wanted to give land to. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, hardly any of them even went to the Carolinas. Uh, but they had distant relatives that did. And some of you might, you might recognize some of these names from, um, like Cooper, I think, is a, a big name in the Carolinas. And Clarendon, you might, might find that, too. And Charles Tun, where the Civil War began, was again named after Charles II. Has anybody been to Charleston? Um, I recommend it. It's cool because it's not only where Fort Sumter is and where the Civil War started, but it's a lot like Boston. So when the Civil War started, or when the Northern armies finally came to South Carolina, I always thought they trashed Charleston because that's where the war started, but they didn't. They went up to Columbia, which is the capital, and they left Charleston alone. And when the war began and Fort Sumter's up here, the people in Charleston left. And that city was really empty from 1862 to 1865. And then when the war was over and people moved back, it was pretty much untouched. So it's like the north, it's, it's like Beacon Hill or parts of the north end in Boston. It's really old, very colonial, very cool, and uh, named after Charles II. So um, I commend that to everybody. Go to Charleston if you get a chance. It's really neat. And like the Virginians learned about tobacco, the Carolinians learned about rice. And they learned about it from the native people. So a lot of the Europeans who went to the New World weren't set up to be farmers. And they learned how to farm and how to grow from, uh, from the native people. And rice is a good example of that. Now, what happens to North Carolina? Well, South Carolina had a whole different topography than North Carolina. So South Carolina is 1670, we'll say. North Carolina is about 1710. And one of the reasons they asked if they could have their own colonies, they had a whole different economy. Um, this did not become eventually the big slave state that South Carolina did. It does. I mean, they, it does become a slave state. But just like West Virginia pulled away from Virginia because of the farming economy, North Carolina pulled away from South Carolina, partly because of um, they tended to be smaller farmers, more independent. These tended to be bigger. They tended to be wealthy. They tended to be kind of your, your man of the, the, the people. And South Carolinians in those early days would kind of look down their noses at the North Carolinians, that these were sort of the hicks. Uh, but these were the upper class types. All righty, the Dutch in New York. So when Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson River, he was working for the Dutch. And of course, he didn't know what we know. It was going to be one of the great metropolises on the planet. But that original Dutch colony was at the very, very tip of Manhattan. And you can see uh, you know, what has happened since. And they built a wall to protect themselves from wild animals and such, and that is now Wall Street. 
And what's really neat about going into the southern tip of Manhattan, even today, is this canal, for instance, is now Broad Street, and it just follows the curvature. And going in southern Manhattan today is a lot like going into North End. The streets just go every which way. The famous grid that we know about in New York City, uh, that grid doesn't really get started until about whatever street that is, 20th or something. So everything south here is just a jumble. And then they do the grid uh, north of that. So when the Dutch were here, um, they left their mark. So of the five boroughs of New York City today, Staten Island comes from the Estates General, which was the Dutch government. Uh, Brooklyn is a Dutch word, and the Bronx is a Dutch word. Queens, of course, is English. Manhattan is an Indian word. And the color of the New York Mets, red, white, and orange, is the color of a Dutch pirate flag. Blue and white for the sea and the sky, and orange for the royal family of Holland, the House of Orange. So, so Peter Stuyvesant, with the peg leg, he worked for the Dutch East India Company, or the West India Company. And he was the man who ran the colony. But most of the people who were there, uh, they themselves were not Dutch. Uh, you had all kinds of people from all over the world coming to New Amsterdam. And that's one of the legacies of New York City today. It's very cosmopolitan. Well, one day in about 1640, the British Navy showed up in the harbor. And they demanded that the, the Dutch surrender, because they were at war in other parts of the Atlantic. And Peter Stuyvesant, who was the company man, uh, he was all set to fight, but nobody would fight. They were too busy making money. So he had to surrender, which he does, and the Dutch flag comes down, and the British flag goes up, and New Amsterdam becomes New York. And the reason it's called New York is the Duke of York was the head of the, Dutch, uh, the British Navy. So he named it after himself. But what happens to Peter Stuyvesant? Well, the Brits don't care what happens to him, so he stays. And he moves uptown a little bit, and he farms. And uh, if you've ever been to the Bowery part of New York City, Bowery is just a Dutch word for farm. There's an angular street where there shouldn't be one. It's just this grid, but then there's this angular street, and it's Stuyvesant Street. One end of it is the church where his body still is. And the other end is just a neighborhood, and they think that he lived here, walked on this path, to church. And that path retained his name. So when Peter Stuyvesant died, here's his grave, I've actually seen this, he was buried in a Dutch reformed church because he was Dutch. But when the Brits came they tore that church down and built an Anglican church. But they kept his body there. It's still there. You can go see Peter Stuyvesant's grave. Got that Justin? Yep, put that on the list. <laughs> yeah. The it's, sun's it's, thrilled. It's slick. <laughs> we love Stuyvesant. <laughs> now, here's, here's one of these fun facts. You know, where does New Jersey get its name? Well, Charles II, when he was in exile, after his dad got killed, spent some time in France and also the Jersey Islands. So when New Jersey was formed, uh, they just named it after this island where he used to live. And uh, it became just sort of an overflow of New York City. Um, so, and the next state too, Pennsylvania, I think is the next one. Yeah. Now, William Penn, we all know his story, but see, his dad was an admiral in the British Navy, and the Brits owed him a lot of money, but they didn't have it. So they said, we'll give you land in the New World and we'll just draw a map. So you notice a straight line here, straight line here, Ohio River maybe, we'll figure it out later. But Admiral Penn himself couldn't go, so William Penn went. So both New York, or all three, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania are all related to the British Navy, sort of giving favors to people. So William Penn, there is what he looks like. <laughs> But he is not the Quaker Oats guy. 
<laughs> Although the Quaker Oats guy has slimmed. Have you noticed this? This was the Quaker Oats guy when I was a kid, but the new guy's a little... Oh, he is. Less he's a little, pudgy. He's yeah. a little thinner in the face, so maybe he's been working out or something. That's from all the Quaker Oats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and quote and Quaker Oats as oatmeal, not as cookies. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chin though. So we, all, we know about the Quakers here in the Blackstone Valley, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Quaker yeah. Highway, the Quaker Meeting House, and so on. And there's William Penn on the top of the State House in... Uh, Philly. Anybody want to explain why the Quakers were controversial, though? Why were they kind of persecuted a little bit in the 18th century? What wouldn't they do? Well, they wouldn't fight. Exactly. <laughs> You're supposed to fight for your country or whatever, but the Quakers were pacifists. And that got them in some hot water. So that's one of the reasons why William Penn started Pennsylvania as a place for Quakers to come without getting hassled. Pennsylvania just means Penn's Woods, right? In Latin. How we doing, Justin? Doing okay? Well, you're doing great. All right. 744. All right. So, the last one is uh, Georgia, named after George II, who was a German, House of Hanover. And originally, Georgia was going to be sort of Carolina stuff that wasn't used up yet. And in this, this map's a little bit clearer. One of the really big issues for Georgia was keep an eye on the Spanish. Because they are in Florida, right? Florida comes from the Spanish word for flower. So even as we were establishing our 13 colonies, we were paying attention to other countries. The French up in Canada, the Brits kind of all over, well, we were British, but where did the British line end? But the Spanish were real, people were really nervous about that. Um, and the other thing that's really cool about this map is when everybody settled on these colonies, they had no idea how big the continent was, right? They didn't know it was 3,000 miles. So they just drew land claims into infinity. So they just drew these lines. And they had no idea the Mississippi was out here or whatever. So as we get into uh, independence especially, um, one of the big issues down here is going to be Florida. Uh, who, which president actually sends troops into Florida without the permission of Congress and basically grabs it from the Spanish? Anybody know? It's Andrew Jackson. That's not my story right now. He, his attitude was, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And, and that's what he did. So these are the Georges. So the House of Hanover is a German family. And there were four kings of Britain who were Germans. Now, any takers on why the Brits did that? Why would they go to Germany? I mean, Victoria was a German, right? Because they were Protestant. Exactly. Yeah, good for you. That whole Reformation in England did not go well. Elizabeth worried about it, and William of Orange worried about it. So finally, the British went outside of their own country to get a family that they knew were going to be Protestant. And they were from Hanover, Germany. The main street of the North End in Boston is Hanover Street with one end, which is the same spelling. So this is the king during the settling of Georgia, George II. Um, and here's Vicky, of course. Um, anybody want to try why did the, her dynasty name was the House of Saxe-Coburg? Why did they change that in World War I? Because they were fighting Germans. Yeah, you can't be fighting the Germans and have a German last name of your sovereign. So they looked through the, the books and they found Windsor. And that's our current queen is the House of Windsor, right? But um, that, this Germans are all over the, the royal family. Another fascinating thing about Georgia, though, it was open to missionaries. And uh, John Wesley, the famous missionary and the guy who started the Methodists, he actually was in Georgia for a while and uh, worked on converting Indians and that kind of thing. 
So if you're a Methodist, you know, John Wesley's one of your guys, but he was in Georgia for a while. All right, I have a couple questions I'd like us just to talk about. Um, we're doing pretty well here. So number one, was tension between the European settlers and local Indians inevitable? Justin, what do you think? Could there have been... I think it depends on the settlers. Um, you know, between um, you know, the ones that were after, you know, more, you know, mercantile money-making ventures, you know, uh, had less incentive to conflict. I mean, they, they weren't there to, you know, claim land, to, you know, uh, establish kingdoms. They were there to, you know, take money and run. Um, whereas, you know, the ones who were out to, you know, create their islands on hills and whatnot, I think it was maybe a little less avoidable for them. Okay. Anybody else? Sarah, is that your name, right? <laughs> what do you think? I think the conflict with the Indians was inevitable or they could have figured out a way? Um, I think it was inevitable. Why? Because there, was, there would have been, like, major cultural clash type, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and the cultural difference is how do you view land? Yeah. For white Europeans, land was something you owned with a deed, and for the native peoples, it was something you used and sure. handed off to your descendants. So forget the smallpox and the pneumonia for a minute. You've got that cultural difference on how do you view land. Yeah. And, uh, this, and, and in European thinking, the idea was if you were not farming the land, you were not using it. And you were not a good steward of it. So as they saw the native peoples who weren't farmers, they said, well, they don't have that right to that land because they're not farming it. Well, the Indians said, hold on, we have a whole different worldview than you guys do. So um, that's probably one of the biggest issues that was, as you said, just a cultural difference. All right, number two, what existed from the beginning that points to a north-south split later? Well, the use of the land. Mm -hmm. Elaborate. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you're going to... What's the land in, how's the land in Massachusetts different than the land in Georgia, for instance? Well, I've never farmed in, uh, in Georgia, but, I mean, New England, it's, it's hard scrapple, it's full of rocks, it, it's hard, so you can't have large... It's not set up for plantation economy, right? right? Yeah. Right. So we often people often say, "Well, slavery," but all everybody had slaves. Yeah. Slavery is an easy one to focus on because of what happens later, but one of the big differences is the, the climate and the land. You just can't grow. Cotton needs 220 days a year without frost. You can't grow, well, you can grow tobacco along the Connecticut River Valley, right? Yep. You, you've yep. seen the tobacco sheds out there. So this is, climate and land is probably one of the key answers here. It isn't slavery at first. It becomes that later. All right, identify I, roots I, of I, democracy. Hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Before you go on. Yep. I know Northbridge had slaves. Um, I'm not sure about Sutton. I know Uxbridge did. How about Douglas? Well, we were 1747, so probably. I mean, they didn't get illegal in mass till like the early 1800s, I don't think. I mean, I don't know for sure, but our local library might know. <laughs> okay, identify roots of democracy that occurred in the early days. Justin, I'll call Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we looked at some of them. You've got the uh, fundamental orders of Connecticut. Um, the fact that everybody had rights under English law, under the Charter. Mayflower Compact, kind of. Um, but I want to go to number five, 1619, that's just the year slavery came, so that, that's pretty obvious. But what is there about being an American already in those early days, the 1600s, 1700s, that is going to contribute to a unique American personality. 
and might also support this number three. What's going to be so different living here as opposed to Britain? Hey, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> and what happens if somebody tells you what to do and you don't like it? What are you going to do? Well, mostly you're, you're going to try to work it out or you're going to fight about it. Or? Leave. Or move. <laughs> That's a big part of the story. There is so much land in our country that if you don't like what somebody's doing to you, you're just going to split. And all the things you mentioned, too, right on, this idea that you're sort of a hard scrabble pioneer person, who's going to tell you what to do? And even though we tended to see ourselves as Brits up to the Revolution, people who traveled here before the Revolution already noticed an American personality. And part of that is just the freedom to get up and leave if you don't like something. And that was just not heard of in Europe. It was just, it was too crowded. As I say, my Dutch uh, father-in-law said, the content don't migrate. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, yeah. And then I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, the importance of the Appalachian Mountains. When the framers uh, started writing, started, like Jefferson and others, started thinking about people moving west of the Appalachians, they wanted it to be orderly, and these people who are going to be um, loyal to the government, but it was just people wanted to do their own thing. And they didn't want people telling them what to do. I mean, exactly as you said, that's kind of in our DNA as Americans, but part of it goes back to those early days when, hey, if you didn't like something, you just went. All right, any questions, comments? Sarah, you all set back there? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for okay. coming. Thank you. And Justin, thanks for uh, hosting us. Yeah. I did nothing. This was all you. We thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. So, and you at home, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>